Okay, well, welcome back to the second of two nights for this, summer's, this year's summer session on the US and China. I'm Laurie Dennis, the Assistant Director for the Center of East Asian Studies at the University of Wisconsin. And I'm going to ask you if you haven't mentioned it already, if you can, if you can put in the chat where you're, where you're viewing this from so that our speaker can get a sense of who's in the audience. And I have sent a flurry of emails to you all today including links to last night's recording and a template for lesson plans. So I hope you all received that and that I didn't clog up your emails too much. Um, last night, we were able to talk with historian John Wong about Hong Kong and the Canton region and tea trade in the 1800s. And tonight we're gonna turn to the context of the 1900s and in particular, World War II. And it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Zach Fredman a diplomatic and military historian whose research is about the United States in the world, modern China, and US East Asian relations. He earned his PhD at Boston University and was a fellow at Dartmouth in New Hampshire and then at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. And then he took his current position at Duke Kunshan University, which is a rather unique partnership that he can tell us about soon. Dr. Fredman has given a talk at the university here, and that's where I first met him back in November 2017. And his first book is, come, is about to come out with UNC Press in Durham, and it's titled The Tormented Alliance, uh, colon, because you've got to have a colon in academia, um, American Servicemen and the Occupation of China, 1941 to 49, which is our, oh yeah, he's got a link there for that, and um, that will be the topic of our discussion. I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Fredman, and he can introduce himself and offer some context on Duke Kunshan University and talk a bit about his latest book project. And then we will pause for some, we'll have some time for questions. You can raise your hand as, as needed as we are going here. And then um, we'll conclude with a discussion of, about the impact of COVID-19 on the Shanghai region before wrapping things up. So thank you very much. I'll turn it over to you. Sounds great. So thank you so much, Lori, for this opportunity and for all of you to uh, spend this Wednesday evening talking with me. I'm really delighted to be here. So I'll begin talking a little bit about how I got interested in Chinese history, and then I'll talk about my current research. I think before we have some time for Q&A around 730, then I'll talk more specifically about what it's been like to be in China during the COVID pandemic. So basically, I've been there all the way through May uh, May this year was when I, when I finally got out. So I got into Chinese history kind of randomly. It, it was definitely not what I planned to do. I was always interested in history as an undergrad, but I was interested in Arab-Israeli relations in the Middle East. And uh, I got a job in Israel briefly uh, right after I finished undergrad. And I didn't like it so much, but I had this roommate uh, out there on the kibbutz where I was staying. He was a few years older. And he had done a bunch of travel in Southeast Asia and China. So I thought, well, that sounds good. You know, I can, I, I had got a job lined up to work the next summer in Alaska to save some money. I was interested in doing a little bit more traveling. And when I finished undergrad, I wasn't in a, in a huge rush to get a job right away, but I sort of knew I, I wanted to either go back and get a history PhD and be a history professor or be a foreign service officer. So those were the, the two interests that I had. So I talked to my undergrad advisor, who was a retired foreign service officer who spent most of his career in Africa and Eastern Europe. And he suggested rather than travel in China, I should get a job there. Because this is 2003, winter 2003, spring 2004. He told me there's a big demand in China for learning English. And that no matter what I ended up doing, if it was going back to graduate school to get a PhD or getting trying to get into the foreign service, if I had some work experience in China, uh, and I had some Chinese language skills that it would be helpful to me in either career path. So, uh, I, you know, I knew nothing about ESL teaching and I really knew nothing about China. Uh, I didn't, I hadn't taken any Chinese history classes as an undergrad, but so I, I got a CV ready. I put it on some headhunter site for jobs in China. I went to bed and the next day I had seven offers. I mean, clearly there was this huge demand where really at the time, like, you know, anybody with a bachelor's degree, they were happy to come have teach. So I started doing research about the different places 
And uh, I, in undergrad, I had worked part-time at a Harley Davidson motorcycle dealership. And, you know, sort of like the, the lowest guy in the totem pole, like cleaning new bikes before they went to customers, assembling the ones that had come from the factory. So I learned a bit about motorcycles. And I had this idea of, you know, having this motorcycle adventure of traveling in Tibet. And so I, one of the job offers was in Chengdu, in Sichuan province. And I looked at the map, and I said, wow, you know, that's, that's pretty close to Tibet. So I, I guess I'll take that one. And so I went there, you know, knowing absolutely nothing about China and planning to stay one year. And uh, I ended up staying five. You know, that first summer I, I did that, I bought, I bought a motorcycle and uh, I spent that summer motorcycling in Tibet, Qinghai, up towards to the Mongolian border and just really had the time of my life. And so I came back to Chengdu, really liked it. I had fallen in with like a pretty good group of, of older expat teachers, a couple people that had basically been doing work like this since the end of the Cold War. Uh, you know, had set up a, an English teaching school in, in the Czech Republic in like the early 1990s. And so I had some people that were mentors and then, you know, also met the woman I, who was from Chengdu, who I eventually married. And so I, I stayed there until 2009 when I went back to get my PhD at Boston University. And then also in this time, uh, I had studied Chinese language. I was always working, but I studied part-time at Sichuan University, built up pretty decent Chinese language skills and developed this interest in US-China relations. And I think it might've been mentioned in, in some of the uh, uh, what Laurie sent out, but I was really just struck by this sort of simultaneous hatred of the United States, but also this fascination with American culture. Like there was a strong current of anti-Americanism I saw in China but often these very same people wanted to immigrate to the United States, wanted to come to graduate school in the United States. So this paradox really fascinated me. So I, uh, and then also uh, my wife was a member of the Chinese Communist Party. So I figured uh, I had lost my chance at a security clearance. So the State Department probably wasn't gonna be the way to go. So uh, I applied to graduate school in 2009, got into this program at Boston University to study US-China relations. And I wrote my master's or my PhD dissertation on the US military in China during World War II, just because there had been a lot written on this topic, but it was very American centered. Uh, it rarely used Chinese language sources. So I just seemed to me there was a good opportunity to write a more bottom up history that made use of Chinese archival sources. Uh, academic job market was very tough. By the time I finished, I was lucky to get postdocs in Singapore at Nanyang Technological University, uh, and then at Dartmouth and a program that they had in US foreign relations and security studies. Uh, and then I remember one day when I was in Singapore, looking at the browsing the job ads like I usually did, and I saw this ad for Duke Kunshan University. And so at the time, the university hadn't even been set up, but it was, a, it was going to be a joint venture university between Duke and Wuhan University in China. And there were a couple of other institutions like this in China already. A couple of the British universities, like the University of Nottingham and the University of Liverpool, had set up some joint venture branch campuses in China. And then on the American side, Johns Hopkins had set up a master's degree program in, with the University of Nanjing in the 1980s, but just did a master's degree in China studies or US studies. It's so basically Americans would go there and study all their coursework in Chinese. Chinese would go there and study everything in English. But with Duke, what they wanted to do is set up a global liberal arts college in Kunshan. So Kunshan is like, by Chinese standards, a small city of about a million people located about 40 miles from Shanghai. So it's technically actually a part of Suzhou. And uh, I applied. It was an opportunity where I could do teach on both sides of my specialty uh, with US foreign relations history and modern China. And luckily I got the job and I joined DKU as part of the founding faculty cohort in 2018. So it's basically 23 of us hired by Duke University uh, tasked with building up a brand new university. So we spent a lot of time in the spring of 2018 before the campus opened up at Duke working together, designing the curriculum, designing specific classes, uh, and then came out there in July of 2018 
uh, just to have about another month and a half preparation before our first class started. So we've been open since fall 2018. Our first senior class graduated this spring, getting terrific job placement. I mean, I think out of 220 kids, we had two Schwartzman scholars, we had a Rhodes Scholar, excellent graduate school placement. And our student body is 65% Chinese, 35% uh, foreign from all over the world. So American students are the biggest group. Uh, after that, probably Pakistanis and Ethiopians. But now I think more than 50 countries represented the DKU, you know, from, from all continents except Antarctica. So it's been a real challenge. And I think I can get to that in the later part of the talk uh, about uh, particularly teaching under COVID and this period of heightened tensions in US-China relations, really beginning with Trump's trade war. Uh, but it's been a fantastic experience. I mean, to come in as a junior faculty member, somebody with an interest in US-China relations and really end up being kind of a practitioner in US-China relations, working on the people-to-people -people side of things uh, in this experiment in this, these difficult circumstances. So that's sort of how I got into China studies kind of randomly and, and how I was able to get this job at DKU. Uh, so are there any questions about that before I move on to talk a little bit about my research? I, I did have a question on the Wuhan aspect of it. Wuhan is your partner university, right? And, and do Correct. you interact much with, with them? And, and yeah, I was wondering about that, especially in the context of, because uh, because Wuhan is way, is not that close to you, right? And, and so how does that work to be in Shanghai yeah. working with a university in Wuhan? <laughs> That's right. I mean, so it's, 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 it's fairly minimal, uh, especially in arts and humanities. There's more interaction in the sciences because, of course, we're this liberal arts undergraduate program. We don't have any PhD programs. We have a few master's programs in like environmental policy, electro electronic engineering. So for a lot of science faculty where it's important that they have labs and PhD students, they work a little bit more closely with people from Wuhan. And then there's like a few Wuhan people on various university wide committees. Uh, and then the Chinese leader of the university is appointed by Wuhan. But on the curricular side of things, it's really, it's Duke that's completely in charge. So let me tell you a little bit about, uh, about my research. And uh, so all of you read this uh, article that I wrote about GIs and Jeep girls uh, and the politics of sex in wartime China. And this article is basically spun out of a chapter of my book on the, called The Tormented Alliance, American Servicemen and the Occupation of China. So getting specifically into this book, I can remember this, this topic, I can remember it was in graduate school and learning that after World War II, more than 50,000 US Marines had occupied Northern China uh, after World War II ended. So after Japan surrendered, these Marines came ashore in October, 1945. And their mission, their official mission was to help with the repatriation of Japanese troops. But what they were really there to do was to secure formerly Japanese occupied cities like Shanghai, Tianjin, Beijing, and Qingdao before the Chinese communists or the Russian Red Army could take them over. Because of course, the Soviet Red Army invaded Manchuria uh, right after the first atomic bomb was dropped in October, 1945. So I wanted to do a book that covered this whole period, covered World War II, the US military presence, and also the Chinese Civil War. So it was really this, I think, an, an important time in the history of US-China relations because more than 120,000 American servicemen served in China during World War II in the Chinese Civil War. You know, I say servicemen rather than soldiers because it was about 99.9% .9 male. Uh, a tiny number of women in the Army Nurses Corps came there, but really only in Shanghai after Japan's surrender. So I mean, even to this day, this was the largest ever engagement between Americans and Chinese that took place in China. You know, according to 2010 Chinese census, I think something like only about 70,000 Americans were living in China, certainly a lot less than that today because of COVID, 
And before World War II, it was under 10,000 people. And of course, you know, these are ordinary soldiers during the war. They're mostly in southwestern China because all China's coastal areas have been taken over by the Japanese. So these were not cosmopolitan cities like Shanghai and Beijing. You know, these were backwater cities like Kunming and Chongqing. Uh, and these were Americans from all walks of life, mostly young people. And so the way the book is organized is I look at relationships between these American soldiers and the key groups of Chinese that they interacted with. So one of the big challenges, of course, is, you know, how do you communicate uh, with this group of Americans coming into China? By the time World War II started, the army had something like 20 Chinese speakers, the U.S. Army, and they were only Cantonese speakers. They just spoke the dialect from Hong Kong and Guangzhou. And so the Chinese government under Chiang Kai-shek saw this as a big opportunity. They were going to demonstrate their commitment to the alliance by training thousands of Chinese college students to serve as interpreters for American troops. So I look at this relationship with interpreters and American soldiers. And then also, China had not, they, they, they were very limited to what they could contribute militarily. They had been already at war with Japan for four years by the time of Pearl Harbor. And all of the key industrial regions of China, the key places that made up the Chinese nationalist government's tax base, They'd all been occupied by the Japanese. So they had no capability of manufacturing any kind of modern weaponry. Their best troops had all been depleted in this initial fighting. Uh, so they had interpreters and they thought we could host Americans. We'll provide them with a place to eat and sleep and cultural outreach. So the Chinese government set up this hostel program to house and feed Americans at the Chinese government's expense. So this was a second area of research that I looked at. But of course, on the American side, the US never sent combat forces to China during World War II. They sent Air Force troops you know, that carried out bombings of Japanese held territories. And later on in the war, they actually bombed Japanese home islands with B-29 bombers before they started flying from the Marianas in uh, late 1944. So it was largely logistical troops that were there to serve the Air Force and to train Chinese soldiers. So I look at these military to military relations, largely this effort by the United States to train and equip Chinese forces. Then I look specifically at interactions with civilians and interactions in particular with women. Because as I say in the piece, by early 1945, the US military had really worn out its welcome in China. Uh, you know, people went to China and they were basically disgusted with it. Uh, uh, in all my sources, you know, the most common things people talk about is how bad China smelled, how impoverished it was, how terrible the food was. So people were very frustrated. They didn't understand why they were there, why they were fighting. And of course, there's tremendous poverty in China at this time. So stuff is getting stolen less left and right. Uh, so there's real resentment against the population. And from Chinese perspectives, American troops behave badly. Uh, you know, there's severe problems with alcohol-related violence against the local population by American servicemen who are bored and really see like no other outlet other than just drinking all the time. There's also a tremendous number of traffic accidents that end up injuring or killing Chinese civilians. A lot of Chinese civilians are also injured or killed in accidental shootings. And the US provost marshal, the military courts in China were notoriously lax. Like, I mean, if you refuse an order from a senior officer or talk back, you could get a month or two in jail. Uh, but people were let off with just fines for shooting or even raping Chinese civilians. So was, there's this real culture of impunity but the one thing that led to this backlash against Americans, violent backlash by both Chinese civilians and with a blind eye by Chinese security service was sexual relations between American soldiers and Chinese women. So as you read in the article, there's really two views of these so-called Jeep girls. On the one hand, there are these women who betray their Chineseness by associating with these American soldiers for money or whatever. Or there's this idea that respectable women are being dragged off in jeeps to be raped by American servicemen. Uh, so finally, there is backlash over this very issue. 
And in the end, ultimately, you know, the nothing really changes from the American side uh, because the U.S. really held all the cards in this relationship at this point. Chinese leader Chiang Kai-shek was totally dependent on the U.S. Army uh, to be able to maintain power. So ultimately, he has to deal with this crisis by simply cracking down on his own population. But after the war ends and the geopolitical situation completely transforms with Japan's surrender, then the Chinese communists begin to exploit this resentment against American soldiers' misconduct in China. And that really culminates in December 1946, when two intoxicated Marines raped a 19-year-old Peking University student in Beijing. She was walking home from a movie. And this led to the biggest protest movement in China of the entire nationalist era. So by early January 1945, half a million Chinese take to the streets across the country from Xinjiang to Taiwan to demand that US forces leave. Uh, and these are protests that pretty quickly are, are taken control of by underground Chinese Communist Party members. And by this point, uh, underground party members had infiltrated the student movements at a lot of universities. But because of misconduct of US forces, uh, plus the idea that US weapons and support for the nationalists was helping to fuel this Chinese civil war, there was widespread support for this demand that US forces leave China. Uh, and ultimately, while this protest movement is going on is when the US government's attempt to mediate between communist and nationalist forces uh, through the former Secretary of the Army, George Marshall, who then became President Truman's Secretary of State. So that finally broke down in January 1946, uh, and US troops began withdrawing in large numbers. Uh, and it wasn't then really until fighting broke out in Korea in June 1950 uh, that the US government revived its support for the nationalists then ensconed on Taiwan. So that's a basic overview of my project and uh, how it's important for understanding US-China relations, I think is a good question. So I think for one thing is, you know, we look at US-China relations today and they're very tense, whereas tensions over trade, over intellectual property rights, over geopolitics, over Taiwan, but I think what my research shows is even when the United States and China were allies, you have this very fraught, difficult relationship uh, characterized by distrust and misunderstanding. Uh, so this has a longer history that goes back even further than the existence of the People's Republic of China. I think also what my book shows is that the US military presence in China, although it was undertaken to support the Chinese nationalist government, in the end, it really had the effect of undermining the Chinese nationalists and becoming a propaganda tool that the communists used to seize power in the Chinese civil war. Uh, you know, in particular, this, this 1946 rape case and the protest movement that followed it was really instrumental at decreasing support for the nationalists in urban areas. And then after fighting broke out in Korea in 1950, particularly when the Chinese decided to intervene in October 1950, then the Chinese government used memory of the US military presence in China as a tool to consolidate power by really trying to sell the war to its war weary population by saying if we did not fight the Americans in Korea, they were going to come to China to threaten our wives and sisters and daughters once again. So this gendered narrative based on this US military presence in China in the 40s was really instrumental in the way that the communists sold the Korean War and then consolidated power. And I think also, and this came up actually, I think as, as one of the questions that Laura emailed me is I think uh, the US experience in wartime China is really instrumental in the transformation of American imperialism. <clears throat> so pre-World War II, the United States is a traditional colonial power. Uh, it has an empire in the Panama Canal Zone, in the Caribbean, and in this colony in the Philippines. But World War II really discredits formal imperialism. And I think in World War II, you begin to see the United States in an ad hoc manner try to develop a new way to engage with newly decolonizing countries in a way that gives nominal respect 
to national sovereignty, but still is about the US maintaining control. So when the US military came to China, uh, commanding officers, senior generals completely took it for granted that the Chinese government would be willing to give them command over Chinese military forces. So, I mean, something that would have really been unthinkable in the soldiers that went over to the UK during the war, um, or people, you know, that were, that played an advisory role or uh, were military representatives in Moscow during World War II. But in China, they just took it for granted that uh, Chinese forces would give them command. And of course, it's not at all what the, what the Chinese wanted. And I think another characteristic we see of U.S. imperialism and relations with, uh, with the newly decolonizing world after 1945 is modernization through army building. So U.S. military advisors trained and equipped hundreds of thousands of Chinese troops during World War II, about 39 divisions that ultimately uh, were trained and equipped by U.S. forces. And so this dwarfed anything that happened in the Philippines uh, or with constabulary police forces in the Caribbean during the 1920s and 1930s. So that was on a much smaller scale, uh, but this kind of army building as a way to really build up nations becomes characteristic of U.S. imperialism during the Cold War. Uh, also, like you see in China, this reliance on local interpreters. Uh, and then, you know, if when anything goes wrong or there's any local resistance, then blaming it on local corruption or problems rather than looking at our own assumptions. And I think we, when we look closely at what happened in Vietnam and South Vietnam during the Vietnam War, but also even in Afghanistan, you know, there's a similar pattern in how this fails. You know, when a rival source of power locally is able to exploit resentment against the killing of civilians and misconduct by US forces in order to draw sustenance from beyond the border as South Vietnamese soldiers did from, from as in South Vietnam as they did from North Vietnam, from Laos and Cambodia, or as in Afghanistan as they did from Pakistan, and then ultimately deploy fighting forces that prove more capable than these US trained and equipped allied governments, you know, with the Afghan government under Hamid Karzai or the various South Vietnamese governments. So that's, I think, some contemporary relevance in both US-China relations and in patterns of US imperialism. Uh, so I see now we are about at time for, for questions and discussion. So I'm happy to talk about uh, any of this research, anything with Duke Kunshan, or any other questions that you might have about China, US-China relations, and the pandemic. Yeah, and please uh, go ahead and raise your, your hand if you have questions. We also have submitted questions from Naomi Huffman on, on, the, on abandoning the, the China hands situation, and also from Katie Rotunda on, I think it's also here, let's see. Um, yeah, I think I got four questions from Jen Lee Co, Katie Rotunda, and I know, Greg, yeah, and Naomi. Greg, Greg Stewart is, is on, I think, and had a question about regional hegemony. So I don't, I mean, we have your written questions, but you can also uh, jump in and ask them in person if you'd prefer. Let me go ahead then and start with some of these written questions. Uh, so Naomi asked, how much did abandoning of Mao and support for the Chinese nationalists due to emerging Cold War tensions create the ongoing diplomatic tension between the US and China that still exists today? <clears throat> and then to what extent do you think the removal of the China hands, so these are these diplomats that were in China during World War II, uh, hindered the US ability to accurately measure and react to the emerging PRC in the first couple of decades of its existence? So um, I, don't, I don't think the U.S. abandoned Mao. I mean, there was the army in 1944, July 1944, explored the possibility of some kind of cooperation with the communists, um, because this time the U.S. was really, U.S. military commanders in China were really angry with what they saw as nationalist corruption, 
and unwillingness to fight, uh, even though, yeah, I mean, certainly there's a lot of corruption, but the nationalists actually made real significant contributions to the war effort. Uh, but really nothing came of this because of the objections of Chiang Kai-shek. And it was actually that the US really, they, they ultimately abandoned the nationalists during the Chinese Civil War. Um, so what happened with the end of the Marshall Mission, basically the US started withdrawing its forces from China in 1947. Uh, they continued to provide some aid for the nationalist government, but really by the summer of 1949, it was very clear that the nationalists were gonna lose the Chinese Civil War. And so in August, 1949, the Truman government released this famous 1,054 page word document, the China White Paper, that basically complete, uh, said that the nationalists had lost completely out of, because of their own fault because they ignored the advice of the United States, because they were corrupt. I mean, so it was, uh, I, I, I definitely don't agree with everything from the China white paper, but this was Truman's way of sort of responding to mounting criticism by the Republican party that the US had not done enough to support Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists. So the Americans basically washed their hands of the nationalists. There is a little bit of covert support for them that continues until about October, 1949, really because uh, Truman did not satisfy any of his critics with the publication of the white paper. And you know, there's still some powerful forces within the Pentagon and within the Republican party uh, that, that push for greater aid. But uh, it, the aid, so revival of support for the nationalists doesn't begin until the Korean War. So basically by, by that time, the US uh, strategy revolves around the assumption that the Chinese communists are going to eventually take control of Taiwan. But uh, as soon as the invasion occurs on June 25th, 1950, Truman does two things. He dispatches troops to Korea and he dispatches the seventh fleet to the Taiwan Strait to protect the nationalists. And then this revived alliance that lasts all the way until 1972, February, 1972, when Nixon makes his journey to Beijing. So in terms of the China hands, so these are these diplomats in China that were, uh, a lot of them were, were born in China, grew up in China as missionary children. So the children of missionaries were staged who, who lived in China. And so they had a good grasp of the spoken language, but not the written language. And so some of these missionaries, or I mean, some of these diplomats were convinced that the communists were going to eventually win the Chinese Civil War and as a result of that, many of them were purged uh, during the McCarthyist period in the early 1950s. So I think these diplomats got some things wrong. I mean, they were, they were definitely duped by the communists in the sense that they really didn't see the communists as actual communists. They sort of accepted them at their word of being democratic agrarian reformers that really wanted to have a kind of American style democracy in China. And I think one reason they accepted this, well, two reasons. One, I mean, they were, they, they were disgusted at corruption and inefficiencies of the Chinese nationalist government, but also they, they were able to speak Chinese but not read Chinese. So they're never able to read uh, Chinese Communist Party documents. But I think in the Cold War, I do think having purged all of these China experts from the US government had a real negative effect. Because it's not until the Kennedy administration that you actually get anybody with Chinese language skills coming back into the government. So really throughout the 1950s, all these people are gone. And I think this plays a role in the Vietnam War because what it does is it makes the US government ignorant about this very long history of rivalry between Vietnam and China and how really the Vietnamese, the Vietnamese have defined themselves about a thousand years of their history as resisting Chinese imperialism. So this really led to this groupthink in the US government that the North Vietnamese, that Ho Chi Minh was just a Chinese puppet. Uh, and I think had we had better people in the government, uh, there might've been more people stepping up to challenge this viewpoint. Then we've got a question in the chat. So they used the talking points of the communists. Yeah, I mean, I think they, because of so much frustration with the nationalists, you know, nationalist authoritarianism, nationalist party corruption, uh, and that you know, the communists had very good people to people diplomacy during the war. And it developed through really an ad hoc method of just dealing with American diplomats 
and journalists who are based in Chongqing, because under the uh, new United Front that was set up at the beginning of the war between the communists and the nationalists, the communists were able to have this office in Chongqing throughout the war and to be able to publish their newspaper there and to interact with, uh, with Americans and other foreigners in Chongqing throughout the war. Okay, so I see a question from Gary. Do your research in China allowed you to send a delve into Chinese sources? This American scholarship is limited to our ideologies and perceptions. Do you feel limited in scope or pressure uh, on the cultural influence to focus your work as a critical analysis of the American presence? Um, I mean, I would say I started out kind of wanting to tell this story. So I started out with the World War II story. And uh, you know, knowing that the big things in the story were was this deterioration of U.S.-China relations, culminating in this clash between Chiang Kai-shek and Stilwell in October 1944, where the commander of U.S. forces in the China theater uh, is ultimately withdrawn after he demands unrestricted command over Chinese forces. So I knew that this was a rocky relationship and that it was problematic. Um, but yeah, I think I didn't, I didn't feel pressure by cultural influences. I think the longer, the more I did research, like the harder it was to me to come on to any other conclusion, but like this, this was an alliance that really became a military occupation. And in the research and reading about it, I just found a lot more parallels to the US military presence in occupied Japan, occupied Germany, Normandy at the end of the World War II than I did to the US military presence in other wartime allied countries like Australia or Great Britain. Thanks very much. Fascinating. I appreciate it. Thank you. Sure thing. I'd like to add just a comment on the border with Vietnam that uh, I was coincidentally down in, in Yunnan in, in the early 90s, I think, and, and saw soldiers, Chinese soldiers, on leave coming up to Kunming, the, the capital. And they were clearly soldiers who were coming from a battle. You know, they were, they were, they'd been in, at the border with Vietnam down there. And I, I just, as an American, had no sense of this, um, of this tense, how tense that border was, you know, I, I think along that whole, I think we, we don't really realize China has a lot of neighbors and doesn't get along with a lot of them and, and that there's border, there's border questions all along the South and the Western part. Yeah, I mean, China, so Ho Chi Minh, as, as many of you probably know, uh, you know, had contact with the Office of Strategic Services, the precursor to the CIA. Uh, in wartime China around the end of the war. But yeah, I mean, his real key supporter up to 1970 what was the PRC, uh, was the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and during the Vietnam War, I think China ultimately sent about 300,000 people to assist in their war effort. And they were largely military engineers. So they were repairing sites that had been bombed by the United States, and then they were anti-aircraft troops. So one's operating anti-aircraft artillery, but it's a huge number. But of course, as this whole relationship is going on with, with Vietnam and China, it's very tense, you know, because as you know, China is very critical of Western imperialism at this time, you know, their relationship with Vietnam is very imperial and they really see it as a little brother, big brother relationship. And so this contributes to seething resentment amongst the Vietnamese. And so, I mean, by 1970, the Soviets become the big supporter and uh, Vietnam after playing things very carefully in the split between China and the Soviet Union leans more over to the Soviet side. And this finally culminates in this border war in 1979 between Vietnam and China, uh, which certainly happened with tacit American approval because it was not until after Deng Xiaoping came to the United States, met the Carter administration, normalized relations that China launched this war against Vietnam. What they said is that they were gonna teach Vietnam a lesson you know, related to Vietnamese intervention in Cambodia, uh, opposed to the Khmer Rouge regime, which is a Chinese ally, but also this closer relationship with the Soviet Union you know, and Soviet military forces moving into some of these bases. 
that the Cameron Bay Naval Base that US forces had used. Uh, but it turned out to be a very difficult war for Chinese forces. I mean, they ended up largely fighting against like Vietnamese teenagers in reserves, a lot of guys in their 40s, because the bulk of combat forces of Vietnam were actually fighting in Cambodia at this time, but put up very stiff resistance against the Chinese. I mean, we don't know, we don't really know anything about casualties because the, the Chinese haven't released them, but uh, that they were probably very high. Uh, and then it was a big black eye for the Chinese military. And as, as Laurie says, I mean, up until the 1990s, there's still border clashes between the two countries on the land border uh, and, you know, and some fairly major naval battles at these disputed islands in the South China Sea. And I mean, to this day, that, that relationship between China and Vietnam remains very tense. So Jimmy asked about this question about continuing influences of the US military presence in China. And this was something that, was, that, that I really observed when I was doing research is there was this, a, a very positive public portrayal of the Sino-US alliance during World War II in Chinese popular culture you know, during the 2000s. And I think this happened for a couple of reasons. It was most prominent in Yunnan province, which is where most American forces deployed in China during World War II, because that was the closest part of China to India, where all these troops and supplies are coming into. And although Yunnan province is a spectacularly beautiful province with a kind of diversity in climate and nature that is unrivaled anywhere in China, it's still a relatively poor province. So I think in Yunnan, there was especially this localized effort to look back with pride on this Sino-American alliance as this period when Yunnan was actually was the most important place in China, uh, you know, which is different than today. Uh, and then also there's a, there's a historian at Oxford by the name of Ron Emitter. And he, his most recent research is on how central Chinese narratives about World War II have become to creating a new sense of Chinese identity in the aftermath of Tiananmen. Uh, because the Chinese government in the early 1990s, when they were trying to analyze why the Tiananmen movement had occurred and uh, why these protests had been so widely supported across the country, uh, their conclusion was that the Chinese government had failed in its ideological education in the 1980s. Because although they'd allowed this kind of economic reform and this influence of foreign culture to come into China, basically education and understanding of Chineseness had continued on with, with the Marxist ideology from the Maoist era that nobody really bought into anymore because they could see this wasn't what the country was actually doing. So memory of humiliation at the hands of foreigners uh, culminating in Japan's invasion became central to create this new kind of Chinese identity uh, of victimhood and of the CCP success in ending victimhood at the hands of foreigners. And then World War II in particular becomes held up as this period where China is allied with the other allies of World War II, the British, the Americans in resisting fascism and saving the world. And that China's history of making this contribution to the world hasn't adequately been recognized. <clears throat> All right, looks like I got a couple other questions in the chat I can get to. So have you noticed the trend of sending arrogant representatives to East Asia is more so the result of American exceptionalism, arrogant foreign policy? Yeah, I mean, so I think there's some, some differences in these cases. I mean, I do think that, you know, Racism is the sort of underappreciated, but sort of always present defect in the American approach to empire, uh, without a doubt. And, uh, you know, the way that the United States treats allies in Asia has been different from Europe. Um, you know, Japan, I think, kind of was able over time to, to change this relationship a little bit. You know, Japan got a status of forces agreement 
uh, that gave the Japanese government equal jurisdictional control over the US military presence compared to America's NATO allies. But they did that basically by moving the bulk of US forces to Okinawa. And you know, Okinawa kind of has this special status uh, as this uh, region of Japan that the, the population of the Japanese home islands discriminates against. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that yeah, people local, there's been a much greater effort by the US military to integrate US military forces with local populations in Europe compared to in Asia. I mean, Britain in, in particular, I mean, there's been this large US military presence in Britain since World War II, but they always, they occupied existing bases in terms of housing, they very often integrated with the local population. They could send kids to British schools. Uh, and in West Germany, there was a similar effort from the 1950s onward uh, to really try to make an effort to integrate with the local population. Uh, but it's never really happened in Asia. You know, in Japan, the effort over time was to insulate the local population on the home islands away from Americans. Uh, but in, you know, places like Korea or the Philippines, I mean, you know, really uh, throughout the entire Cold War, you just had this massive boomtown economy largely centered around sex trade and alcohol catering to the Americans and sort of widespread violence and accidents associated with the U.S. military presence being a daily factor of life. And I mean, this comes up in the news pretty frequently uh, in relation to the US presence in Okinawa. So how was Deng Xiaoping able to establish special economic zones with US multinational corporations despite the negative propaganda built up against the US since World War II? So I think with Deng, I mean, in my looking at Chinese history in the, in the 20th century, I see, I see Deng Xiaoping as, as the real revolutionary, even, even more so than Mao because he was the one that was able to see that, that Maoism was a failure and that China's future really depended on much closer relations with the West and Japan and particularly the United States. And I think, you know, people were just so exhausted from the endless political campaigns of the Mao era culminating as this 10 year cultural revolution uh, that there was a lot of buy-in uh, within the Chinese leadership for this kind of change. Uh, but you know, it, it began with the special economic zones. It kind of began at a slower pace, but pretty quickly, uh, you know, by the early 80s, all across the country, people had these opportunities to, to go into small business for themselves. Uh, and you know, and you know, there's pretty solid economic growth by the early 80s that just continues. I mean, really reaches its high point after China joins the WTO in the first decade of the 21st century. Uh, and so how does that match up with the anti-American propaganda? Well, a lot of the anti-American propaganda continues even after Nixon's trip to China in 1972. But it begins to be tamed down a little bit. But interestingly, it's uh, this sort of changing perception of the of the United States military presence in China in World War II. That's that's one of the first big changes. So on, in the Mao period, uh, after the Korean War, there's sort of very little focus on World War II at all in Maoist China because the narrative is, of course, that the Chinese communists led uh, resistance against Japan during the war. And you know this, of course, this wasn't true. I mean, it was the, clearly the nationalists played a leading role in the war effort, but the communists were much more forward-looking. And to the extent that they look back at this history of World War II, it was just part of this longer period of humiliation at the hands of foreigners that only the communists could end. But I think it was around 1980 that a popular Chinese movie came out um, I can't remember what the title was in English, but probably something about the you know, American pilot or American flying tiger. And it was this story about this American pilot who was part of like the volunteer 14th Air Force or volunteer flying tigers, the American volunteer group that fights for uh, the Chinese government before Pearl Harbor. And it was a fake story, but it was you know, about like this guy had gotten shot down and he was aided by communist guerrillas and ends up falling in love with this Chinese communist woman. 
Uh, and so this was like one of the first turns in pop culture of this more approving relationship uh, with the United States. But it's really not until like the, the late 80s and early 90s that a lot of archives begin opening up in China and there's more academic research, like comprehensive academic research about the wartime US-China alliance. But of course, these soldiers who fought for the nationalists and uh, many of them work with the Americans or former interpreters, they were all branded as counter-revolutionaries during the Maoist period. But by the early to mid eighties, the government quietly overturns these, this verdict and these people begin to start telling their stories. I wonder if you could maybe um, talk a little bit at, because uh, we are getting closer to eight, about um, the degree to which the pandemic, the, the impact it had, because some of our questions are also, you know, when, when was the trust broken between the China, China and the US and also, um, have we created better relations with the Chinese people or become worse enemies? And how is, I, I know it's still happening, but how is COVID impacting all that? And, and what are you seeing in terms of like, how we move out of, how do we get along after, after, after such a difficult time this past two years? <laughs> well, so I think even in the periods when there were better relations between China and the United States, and probably the best decade, at least in the history of the PRC was the 1980s. Um, but there's always been this deep, ideological distrust of the United States and China. And so this deep fear of American values and culture. So that's always existed. Whereas on the American side, there's always been this paternalist idea about that really the only kind of accepted modernization for China is one along American lines. And that like, you know, America's improving this relationship with China because hopefully this is going to lead to China's eventual democratization. So I think, you know, when these sort of, uh, uh, from the American perspective, when things don't go this way, John Pomfret talks about this a lot in his book, you know, then this follows like a, this, this leads to retrenchment in the United States and anger and disappointment. And I really see uh, the downturn in US-China relations actually starting pre-COVID and even pre-Trump. Uh, I mean, I think 2008, I think the financial crisis was a real shift. I think in, in the financial crisis, you know, that's when you really start to see a lot of Chinese uh, really you know, across the spectrum, from people in government to ordinary people that really feel like, ah, you know, this is it. Like China is now going to be the world's leading power. Look at the, the West, the United States is in terminal decline. Uh, Americans have no right to talk to us about what we should be doing with our country. So I think 2008 was a really, really big shift. But even when I was in China, uh, you know, from 2004 to 2009, before graduate school, I mean, from the very beginning, there was certainly plenty of hostility to the United States among ordinary people. Still, I, I heard a lot about the bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade in 1999. And a lot of people asked, why did you attack our embassy? But so I think, yeah, 2008 was an important turning point. And then I think, yeah, the, the Trump administration, I mean, things really went downhill very, very quickly with the trade war. I think on the American side, there are were simmering resentments over time at the way that American companies were treated in, in China with intellectual property theft, with forced technology transfer, and with just, I mean, some of the challenges. And China's not really a, an easy place to live. Uh, but then, you know, so the Trump trade war began, then there was the COVID pandemic, which, you know, I think could, could have been an opportunity because it's a global threat for, for, for better cooperation uh, instead has contributed to a worsening of relations. And that has just really continued, unfortunately. Uh, I mean, I think this year in the spring from the Chinese side is really the worst I've seen it uh, with this zero COVID policy in China that culminated in these lockdowns in Shanghai that were actually very unpopular. There was a lot of resistance by the local population and that happening at the same time as the, as the Ukraine war uh, really led to just a heightening of anti-American propaganda. So domestically, uh, it's all just been sort of pro-Russian propaganda that's been circulating about the Ukraine war. It's, it's blamed on the United States, um, whereas China's been more careful diplomatically and I think militarily 
they haven't been breaking sanctions. But in terms of domestic consumption, it's been very much that this, this war is, is the result of the United States. And I think with the, with the anti-Americanism accompanying zero COVID, I think it's just been a way of, to try to distract and deflect anger. Uh, and also that's, that's backfired a little bit. When the, cause when the lockdown happened in Shanghai, Initially, there was a lot of panic that there was going to be a lockdown. The local government announced there wasn't going to be a lockdown. And then a couple of days later, there was a lockdown. They said it was only going to last three days, and it ended up lasting several months. And so in this very initial phase, when people found out the lockdown was going to last more than three days, uh, the Chinese government made an effort on, on Weibo, like one of the big uh, Chinese social media sites, of just making the top stories all anti-American and it and there was real backlash. So ordinary people just started using these story names as like internet memes to attack the Chinese government and the zero COVID policy. But yeah, I mean, I think right now there, I mean, there, there, there are some real differences in the country, in the in the two countries. I mean, clearly China wants to take control of Taiwan. And I think uh, you know. But I think there, there, there's, a, there's a decent chance that the U.S. would intervene militarily uh, if, if China were to do that. I mean, so I do think there's the real possibility of war in the Taiwan Strait. At the same time, I don't see this kind of uh, just really unresolvable ideological conflict like the United States had with the Soviet Union during the Cold War. I mean, China, it's a, it's a Leninist government. It's a one-party Leninist government, but it operates on the global economy, and its trade with the United States is, uh, has been an important tool of its development. And really, no country, no foreign country has made a greater contribution to, to Chinese modernization and economic growth since the early 1980s as the United States. And a lot of people recognize that. Uh, you know, there's been, I'd say, a very good proportion now of Chinese who are in their 30s and 40s, uh, who are probably the, the next generation of leadership at top corporations, in the arts, even some levels of government are, were educated in the United States. So I, I try to be as optimistic as I can, but it's, it is admittedly tough in this environment to maintain that optimism. Other questions I could talk a little bit more about just sort of uh, other observations during during the pandemic in China. There is a question I see, but one uh, one thing I I did wonder about is the 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 COVID lockdowns in China seem to have had such a bad effect on the economy, and I didn't think that that would be allowed. That I thought as long as the economy is going well. Um, people support the government. So I, I've just been surprised at the, the willingness of the government to have lockdowns that will have such a bad effect on, on economic growth, slow, that will slow growth. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been surprised to see it too. But I think like with, 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 with Xi Jinping, I mean, from the beginning, like he was invested in the zero COVID approach and I think to change that in any way right now could potentially weaken him in, in the kind of system that he exists in. So I, I do I do fear that's going to continue, and I, I think it could continue even beyond this this twentieth party congress in the fall. Uh, but I hope not. I think there's there's resistance to it in China, uh, really across the social spectrum. I mean, of course, Chinese elites dislike it because you know these are people that are also accustomed to international travel but so do a lot of ordinary people because it has been economically devastating i mean to people who work in restaurants people who work in the service industry uh you know it's it's really affected the livelihoods of a lot of people in china um well, yeah, it's, it's uncertain how long this can continue. I mean, at the beginning, people were very supportive because when this thing hit in 2020, sort of nobody knew how bad it was, but it clearly was very scary. I mean, at that time, I was quite fine with like staying in my apartment for like two months, you know, just doing like a, uh, 
occasional trip to like fill up an entire shopping cart at Sam's Club while like in rubber gloves and a mask and just being super careful. But, you know, people, yeah, I, I think people are getting sick of how long this has gone on in China for sure. So Greg writes on Taiwan, uh, so semiconductor devices, yeah. Um, I mean, I think this will influence the US role in Taiwan, but I think really it's, it's more sort of geostrategic. Uh, you know, the US has this long history with the ROC government in Taiwan. You know, there were formal allies during the Cold War. Uh, there's still been this very strong trade relationship uh, an unofficial diplomatic relationship with Taiwan ever since the 1970s. And I think the assumption uh, in Taiwan and in China, uh, despite the strategic ambiguity uh, of US policy towards the Taiwan Straits is that the US would intervene in any military conflict. And like, that's probably the only thing that's prevented China, China from trying to take over Taiwan by force. Uh, yeah, so it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's still on, certain, but uh, yeah, when you look back at the whole history of the Cold War and these US military interventions during the Cold War that were always rationalized by that the United States was intervening to further the cause of freedom and democracy. And the only places they really worked are these, these, these two half countries, South Korea and Taiwan. And uh, so I think there, yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be a big strategic setback and a big geopolitical change if China were to take control of Taiwan. You know, there are a lot of commentators who say, well, this would end US credibility in Asia. I mean, that's not necessarily so as the US, you know, it wouldn't affect any kind of formal uh, defense treaty with Japan, with South Korea, with the Philippines. Uh, but certainly, I mean, it would enhance China's economic position and military position to have control of that area. Yeah, I think right now, I mean, in terms of US-China relations, I think it, you know, one of the best hopes the United States could have is, is to prevent a, a forcible military takeover of Taiwan and to be able to do that without a shooting war. Now, I don't know if that's going to be possible, but uh, given like the, the shrinking disparity between China and the United States economically, militarily, that might be the best that the United States government can hope to do. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I teach a lot of students that are from China, and I always find it really difficult to talk about China um, with my students because I don't, I, my students are in high school. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of different like power dynamics and layers and things like that. And I don't necessarily want to influence them one way or another about their own country. Um, and given that you are currently an American teaching in China, how do you navigate some of these like really difficult conversations where, you know, the, the reality of, um, of what maybe you are seeing is not the same reality of your students, or you just have multiple perspectives in a classroom and you are trying to have these types of conversations. Well, yeah, I mean, this sort of gets at one of, one of the fundamental challenges of being at a place like DKU. And it is hard because, I mean, a big part of the, the patriotic education campaign in China that's been run since the early 1990s and just in the general public discourse, I mean, a big focus of this is that sort of that any criticism of China, of the Chinese government is a criticism of the Chinese people and an attack on the Chinese people. And that, that and, and to be distrustful of foreigners, I think also is something that's a real central undercurrent to all of this patriotic education. So it makes it difficult. Uh, you know, I teach our, our freshman common core course, China the World. That's like the one class on China that every Duke Kunshan University student has to take. And uh, I mean, I feel like as this institution in China that has this deal with the Ministry of Education for academic freedom, uh, 
that we've got to deal with some challenging issues. And so in this course, China the World, I mean, the, I have a module on war and war memory that looks specifically at the experience of World War II and the Chinese Civil War and their legacies. And we look at the origins of the patriotic education campaign. We look at the reality uh, of World War II and the Chinese Civil War. And so I think I don't shy away from controversial issues, but you know, I, I'm careful with how I teach it. Uh, for one thing, I really historicize it. So my class, you know, even in the syllabus, it says, you know, our job is not to just regurgitate the opinions of these scholars we're reading. You know, we're looking at sources that come from China, that come from other countries, but our goal is to first understand and then question and maybe even challenge these readings, that that's okay and that that's actually the aim of the course. And then also really looking at things in a historical context, really trying to understand, uh, you know, why did the patriotic education campaign come into being? You know, why does the Chinese government censor information uh, about Chinese history? And I think looking at it that way, and also looking at it in a comparative context, I think can help. You know, my first lecture about war memory, I preface it by, talking about how memory of the Holocaust evolved in Israel and about, you know, well, here's this place that was democratic where people had access to sources, but still it wasn't until after the 1967 war that there was really any acad academic and public discourse interest in the experience of the Holocaust, that really it took 20 years, it took a whole generation and it took this successful war for people being able to deal with this. And so the point is that, you know, dealing with traumatic history is extremely difficult, regardless of the system of government. And so I think in this way, that's helped me deal with these more challenging and controversial issues in China. I mean, I still get a bit of pushback uh, every, every term, but in general, student evaluations for that class tend to be really good. And a lot of Chinese students that are interested in learning this history because students know they have had this very ideological education and a lot of them are curious about learning more. There's a question, if, you, if Taiwan were to come under control, <clears throat> do you think that would embolden North Korea to take action? I know the US military has a huge presence in the RK, but what might Taiwan impact my Taiwan have on the Korean Peninsula? Um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, you know, I think Korea under this, this Kim dynasty, I mean, I think they, they have shown some kind of fundamental restraint since the Korean War ended in 1953. I mean, they they, they fire, they do frequent missile tests. You know, they have assassinated South Korean officials in other countries. You know, they sank this uh, South Korean naval corvette a few years ago, uh, but they haven't taken any kind of major action that I think could lead to war. So I think there has been some restraint there. And then clearly uh, there, there has been restraint with China. I mean, those offshore islands that, uh, that are under the control of Taiwan you know, they're only, some of them are only two miles off the coast of Xiamen in China. I mean, they're just right there where you can see them from the city and I think could very easily uh, be occupied by, by China, but they haven't done that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think if, if a war there happens, really all bets are off. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's really scary to think about. I mean, in a cold war with mutually assured destruction, I mean, this prevented a superpower struggle. But of, coal, of course, the Cold War you know, was a hot war in many places around the world, particularly in Latin America, in Southeast Asia, in Africa. Uh, with a, Paul Thomas Chamberlain wrote a book about this, a historian, I think now he's at Columbia, and I mean, he thinks maybe a total of 20 million deaths in proxy war conflicts during the Cold War. Um, but yeah, I mean, a, 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 a superpower war over Taiwan or, you know, or a conflict in Korea, I mean, it's, it's really frightening to think about. And like, clearly, the government in North Korea, I mean, I think they would like to reunify the peninsula under Korean control. 
but I think there, there is a, a real appreciation there for the realities of, of American power and also of South Korean power. We're kind of at time and that seems like a kind of depressing way to end things. So I wonder if you could possibly maybe end with, is there anybody, when you look at Chinese U.S. history, is there any, is there a figure that really stands out as a, as someone you admire? Yeah, I mean, there, there are a lot of people, for sure. Um, I mean, I think, you know, somebody like Hu Shi, like a, a Chinese intellectual of, of the May 4th Chinese Enlightenment movement, you know, starting in 1919, who really looked to the outside world, uh, had a had a diplomatic role uh, as, an, as an ambassador to the United States for a while. I mean, something like that. And I think fundamentally, I, I, I try to have this kind of optimism about US-China relations. And a lot of it is be, because of my experience in Taiwan, actually. And you know, seeing this place that is, that is still Chinese, that is Chinese speaking, that you know, has this legacy of Chinese history, but that has been able to have a democratic government, that's been able to have this cosmopolitan attitude towards the outside world, deal with uh, this, uh, this legacy of Japanese imperialism successfully. You know, so I, I do think there's a, there's a possibility of things improving. I mean, uh, there's a lot of young people in China that are eager to see the outside world uh, travel to places like the United States. I mean, even you know, at the, at the first year COVID hit, there was something like 350,000 Chinese students studying in the United States. So I think that you know, clearly a lot of Chinese people see that the United States has a lot good to offer. And I think even uh, within government in the United States, may, maybe just within the Democratic Party, but I think there's a recognition that, that you know, China is not this existential threat to the United States like the Soviet Union was. Okay, well, thank you very much. And, and to all of the teachers in our audience, it, it's been our hope that speaking directly with, with historians who are currently working in the field and also receiving books and materials and including a curriculum guide is gonna help you approach the complex topic that is the US and China. <laughs> and I also, you know, I think we all really believe that when things get tense on the global stage, we have to rely even more on our teachers to remind people of the history and connections and challenges that we've already endured. So your role is really critical to the success and, you know, to, to is, is, is really critical to our future. And I hope that you will consider the Center for East Asian Studies a resource and keep in touch. I'm happy to work with um, any of you or your students or groups of students working on a project or anything like that. I can connect you to uh, expertise and people like Professor Fredman with specific questions that you might have and things like, and you know resources that you might want to consider and things like that. And, and I just want to thank you for being part of the East Asian of the Midwest program. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And yeah, I mean, I'll say, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you my email address. I mean, feel free to, to reach out if you have other questions. Uh, you know, I've done, done some work, uh, some engagement with, you know, in this era of Zoom, of being able to, to talk with high school students in the United States who are doing projects on U.S.-China relations. And so I'm always happy for that kind of engagement. Okay, great. Well, thanks a lot, everyone. We'll, we'll put this recording up and get it all snazzed up and ready, and, and ready to view, and I'll get you the link, and we'll be in touch. So that's all for tonight. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.